answer is D, and I'm happy that most people got it. And I'm happy most people didn't choose A, which I would think would be the trap answer, um, because they did mention that they are contradicting, or I think, let me get the exact wording. Um, these two concepts are contrasting, but not necessarily contradictory. So I'm glad that uh, people didn't get trapped in by that. Um, so let's talk about why it's D. So involve differing notions of the desirable society. So we know that um, utilitarianism, a utilitarian society is one in which most people are prospering with a select group of people uh, suffering. So maybe think of uh, slavery, um, kind of piling on like misfortune onto the like poor or a certain small group of people um, and they are suffering, but in exchange, the majority of people are having a good time and prospering, right? Whereas in contractarianism, like they mentioned, um, most people enjoy the most amount of liberty possible for everybody to have. And it's a relatively equal amount of liberty. So there are two completely different societies, um, a contractarian society and a utilitarian society. So their ideal goal for the society, as you can see, is very different. One wants, they both want a prospering society, but what that means is completely different for each of them. One wants a society in which everybody has equal amounts of liberty, even if that means um, people aren't having the best lives possible. But if they're all relatively equal lives, that's the best case scenario. Whereas uh, contractarianism wants the majority of people have the best lives possible, even if it means a small group has to have the worst lives possible. So completely different societies that they are striving towards. Um, start from similar ideas of human nature. Um, I wouldn't say this. I think this, out of the other answers, this is the closest one. And that's why I got the most votes, but I do think it's not exactly right. So I think they do start from different ideas of human nature. So like, um, they, and this is one where you really have to do, let me get rid of the numbers, so it's just not distracting. This is one where you do have to do like a little bit of inference and kind of like reasoning. Um, so in order for a contractarianism society to work, um, humans have to not be greedy. And this is how they, um, this is what he talked about here. Uh, might well decide to gamble on the outcome of the social order. Again, like people can be greedy, people can gamble or stuff like that. But generally, contractarianism relies on the fact that people are acting in kind of, I guess, their own self interest in a way, right? Or by like not being too greedy and where it's possible for them to also be in the bad position. So they want to have like a decent position for themselves. Um, whereas uh, utilitarianism doesn't really have that. It really um, kind of sees man as more chaotic and in need of like control, I guess, in a way. Um, and they kind of talk about that a little bit here and a little bit in here. Right, but this is one that they kind of, they, they don't start from the same position, right? So they, they have like different ideas about what human nature really is. Um, one kind of thinks humans are kind of like naturally like self-serving and kind of like orderly, whereas other things are more chaotic and needs to be controlled. Um, they agree on several major points. That's that would be outside information. B would be outside information. They don't mention any points that they agree on. So I would say B is incorrect. And A conflict with each other um, and nobody picked this, I'm glad. It, they specifically said they're contrasting but not necessarily contradictory. Yeah, um, hope we'll mention that, yeah. So yeah, they, that was a coincidence. I didn't mean to do that. And uh... hey, Mark, quick question. So mm -hmm. the last two questions, I've narrowed it down to the the uh, the two um, correct answer choices, and I always choose the one that's incorrect. I've always managed to narrow it, get rid of the bad two ones, and then somehow choose the 
next bad one and you know it's just as bad as if you didn't really know so um it makes one answer choice much better than the other because so it, uh again um okay. again it well it, it depends on from question to question obviously but um really kind of find ways you can when it comes down to that um that's already a good start it's unlucky that you twice you've gotten it but two is a small sample size there's 60 questions so two is a very small sample size. So um, at least the 50-50 is much better than the 25%. But it, we do obviously want um, you doing better, like getting consistently more uh, right. So I would say try, and once you've narrowed down to two, try to eliminate, see if you have, based on the passage, any rebuttals against any of them, anything in the passage that could possibly disprove either one of them. If you can't find anything that really disproves one of them, then that's probably the correct answer, right? So like, again, start from similar ideas of human nature. That one's a little bit more iffy and there's a lot more that you could really like, kind of like hits you could get against it where it's like um, contractarianism really is, human nature is kind of more um, orderly and people will, and more rational, whereas uh, utilitarianism people don't really know what's necessarily good for them and they'll uh, be in their own interest so we have to kind of do what's best for um, the most people like ourselves so that's kind of like you can hit make hits against c whereas d you can't really find anything in the passage that would disprove it so that's why it would be a better answer choice i think um sometimes you really do have to ga gamble and go for 50 50s i know i did a couple of times as well um both in the practice test and on the real test as well. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. You um, kind of have to take the hits where you get them. Uh, you don't need a perfect, uh, you don't need to get every single question right in order to get a perfect score. I most likely didn't, most likely got a couple of wrong, but you don't need it, uh, every question right to get a perfect score. So sometimes you can, but again, try and find anything you could use against any one of the answer choices and see which one there's less evidence against. Does that make sense? Yes, and again, you said the word practice, so it will come with practice. Me making exactly, exactly. Narrowing it down to fifty and still getting it wrong is same as me narrowing it down to one out of twenty. You know, one out of four wrong is wrong. You know, what I'm saying. Um, I'm not so I I don't. So in terms of on the real test, yes. But in terms of practice, no, because if one out of 20, that means you had completely no idea what you're doing and you can't, how do you build up from that? It's like a long way to build up. Whereas one out of 50, um, first, it's more likely that next time you'll get it right. If you consistently narrow down to 50, 50 there's more chance you get it right. And there, it's easier to improve upon. It's easier to kind of like take that one step up. Yeah, so on the real test, yes, but in practice, no. Okay, um, next. Um, and this is, if you've taken any practice tests, um, you'll have encountered these types of questions, strength and weaken. Once you understand the main idea of anything, whether it be the whole passage, or maybe it could be just one paragraph in the passage. So they may ask you, what is the main idea of the passage as a whole? Or they may actually ask you, what is the main idea of one of paragraph three, paragraph four, paragraph five of the passage, right? And you have to kind of essentially um, scale it down, do exactly what you do for the whole passage and just scale it down to on a one passage level, uh, on one paragraph level. Um, normally after each question, I believe there's five to six. I believe some passages have five, some have six um, after each passage. Um, but yeah, um, so again, doing a paragraph pass the same thing, uh, similar. Um, what they may, and then once you have the main idea, you should have an idea of how to strengthen or weaken that idea with evidence, right? You should have an idea of what evidence uh, would support it and what evidence would disprove uh, whatever that idea is, right? Um, there's many forms of support or opposition that include but are not limited to Statistical research, specific examples, new findings, et cetera. So statistical research could be something like 40% um, of people who do this 
uh, this thing, this exercise live 10 years longer. That's a statistic or whatever. That's one way to support whatever exercise you are um, kind of peddling. Um, specific examples, maybe it could be um, if you're trying to support, say, utilitarianism or contractarianism, say societies that like there's this society in history and this society in history that have used very similar models to contractarianism or utilitarianism, and they have prospered very greatly because of it. Um, and you just specifically point to uh, like specific nations or specific uh, civilizations in history that have done that have used what you've done and they've like prospered or something like that. Um, a new finding could be like any kind of scientific evidence, um, kind of ties into statistical research, except this is more, statistical research doesn't necessarily have to be scientific. It could be just a percent of people and could just be a fact, whereas a finding is necessarily kind of like a causation. I don't want to get too much into that, but statistics, it's more like a fact, like, um, 50% of people who smoke die sooner or something like that. Uh, I don't know. And finding could be that it is a specific thing in cigarettes that leads to death. Something like that. I don't know. Um, uh, you must determine what the significance of each of these uh, points of evidence means. How does it relate to the main idea? Does it support the main idea? Does it um, go against the main idea? How, how does it work with the main idea? Okay. Um, for example, I want to go back to the author John, who wrote about stem cell research and its lack of efficacy. Um, if you were told that no new technology in the last 30 years was based on stem cell research, how would that relate to the main idea of John's paper? Since the research has not led to any innovations for a very long time, well, the answer is, since the research has not led to any innovations for a very long time, you can logically reason that the research is not very effective, right? If you're doing research for 30 years and you get no answers, it's probably not necessarily good research. Um, this would be in line with John's opinion, who argued that stem cell research is a dead end, you're not going to get anything out of it, and he would support it because it's in line with it. Um, and it would thus be a detail that would strengthen his claim, so he could use that as evidence. right? On the contrary, if over 10 new uh, different new approved drugs released in the five years were based on stem cell research, we could logically conclude that the research is effective and that would weaken John's claim. Again, if he claims that stem cell research is not effective, it's a dead end, it's a waste of money, but then we have this um, finding or the statistic that over 10 new drugs uh, released in the five years are based on this research, we could say, we, we would know that, well, this research is effective, therefore his claim is uh, wrong, and this, and this weakens his main idea. This goes against his main idea. Okay, that's very simple and all that. Um, but let's put this into practice again and let's combine all the things we've learned so far um, to try and put in practice. This is passage two on your, um, on the Google Doc, which I'll put in one last time in the chat for anybody that's new. Um, 